think? Meeting is now streaming on Facebook Live. Wonderful. All right. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, we are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, which, as you all know, is from September 15th to October 15th. And so we're smack dab in the middle of it. I wanted to take some time to make sure that we lend a space to amplifying the voices of the Latinx community in Florida. So I'm Savannah Roach. I'm FCB's digital organizer. And this year, we've been putting a lot of focus on working on the election and uh, getting folks all the resources that they need to vote, particularly vote by mail or vote early so you can avoid crowds on election day and stay as safe and healthy as possible. But tonight, we want to talk specifically about how voting can be used as a tool to combat some of the threats facing the Latinx community throughout Florida. So tonight, I'm joined by very lovely panelists. We have Carson Mitchell, FCB's wonderful communications director, our comms queen, don't know what we'll do without him, and as well as Jesus Reynoso, FCB's Chispa digital organizer, who is brand new and we're really happy to have him, as well as Maria Reyes, representing um, Fodaka Madre and a community activist and we're very excited to have them all tonight and Maria will take it away to, to introduce our other panelists. Hola, buenas noches. I'm so happy to be here. Um, yes. Um, so I am joined by two wonderful women that I deeply love and admire and that I have, you know, work uh, side by side in the community. Michelle Suarez from uh, Central Florida, Kaima Ashon. Michelle is a legendary climate justice organizer here in Central Florida. She has worked on uh, the, the field. She has global experience and I'm so glad to have her here. And the other panelists that we're gonna have here joining us tonight is Crisia Lopez Arce. Crisia is an organizer, journalist, media person, uh, excellent also communicator, and has her own story of climate change. She personally is uh, you know, uh, displaced by climate change by Hurricane Maria from Puerto Rico. She landed here and she is determined to make a change. Uh, so I'm very happy to join in uh, this evening with these two wonderful ladies that I admire so much. Thank you, Maria. So I just want to go around the table before we dive into the discussion, the discussion topics for this evening and allow everyone to introduce themselves. And so we'll, we'll start with Carson. Hey, everyone. I'm Carson Mitchell. I'm, uh, like Savannah said, the communications manager with Florida Conservation Voters. I handle a lot of our social media, so it's really great to be on the on the front facing side of the screen today. Um, and I really look forward to um, talking with our panelists today and and really sharing um, some of the concerns in the Latinx community. Wonderful, thank you, Carson. And next I'd like to highlight Jesus Reynoso, who's super new to the FCV team and would like to hear from him. Jesus? Uh, hey guys, my name is Jesus. I'm the digital organizer for Chispa. Uh, we're excited to announce that Chispa is coming to Florida. Uh, Chispa means spark and is a national initiative of the League of Conservation Voters. So I'm just super happy to be here and thankful for you guys coming on today. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Jesus. And, and again, I'd love to introduce Crisia. Tell us some about your work and about yourself. Me? No? Hi, my name is Crisia Lopez Arce, and I'm here representing La Mesa Boricua de Florida. I'm the community organizer for Central Florida. So I've been working with the community since I came after the hurricane. For me, it's an honor uh, to be here sharing this panel with Michelle because I learned so much from her when I began to work here with the community. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm so glad you guys mm -hmm. were able to join us. Michelle, would you like to tell us about yourself? Hola. Thank you so much for the introductions. And I'm also like super happy and honored to be here with Cristian and Maria, because really, as you know, we're in Florida. So we've seen it. We've seen it all. Um, but a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Colombia. 
and have been in Central Florida here for 20 years now. Um, and just involved in, in the movement, right? Just learning about climate justice from different angles. Um, so from the local angle, I am representing the Central Florida Climate Action, which is a new alliance of labor, faith community groups, um, just impacted communities that finally, you know, after many years of having this vision came together to form this alliance to, fi alliance to finally strategize, you know, our climate justice vision, right, for, for Central Florida. So I'm representing, you know, the Alliance tonight, but I also do other collective work, especially like international solidarity. So um, have done some work in Guatemala with indigenous movements, and as well as we're connected to other movements in Colombia. So just kind of, you know, also having like that perspective. Yeah, thank you for having me tonight as well. We're so grateful that we get to talk about all of these issues with such a very diverse panel. So thank you so much for everyone's participation. And so to jump right into what we're here to talk about, you know, we're in election season and we're in Hispanic Heritage Month. And there's so many places for those two topics to intersect. And so I just want to start us off with talking about what, what fuels our vote, what inspires and encourages us to vote. You know, for me personally, it it's not only voting for myself, but also voting for other people who don't who don't live the same life that we all get to live. You know, like uh, there's always going to be someone who could benefit from our vote. There's multiple people on your ballot, not just the president, not just your senators. There's a lot at stake on the ballot, and so we're not just voting for ourselves. We don't show up only for ourselves. We show up for others, and we also show up for our land. And, you know, that's really fueled me to um, do this work with FCB and to inspire me to show up at the polls. Like, I'm pretty young. I, haven't, I don't have a ton of voting experience, but I just love that it, there's so many resources available to us to help us be engaged as voters and really make a difference because it seems like a small thing, but it's actually a really big thing, you know, and so... I just wanted to like open up the floor for everyone to um, bring to the table what inspires your vote, who do you vote for, not, in, in, not in terms of a candidate, but who are you voting to protect, who are you voting for the rights for, and what inspires your vote. I don't know, I can start. Uh, I think that um, this year is a very powerful year. Um, in my case, I have been a, an organizer my whole life. I, I always make a joke that I have never had a real work, right? All my work has been organized in organizing locally, organizing nationally. And also I, I, I have done for the last probably 20 years, uh, global work, right? And to me is the, those, those, those times that I do international work, mostly in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, it's a, a stark reminder that decisions that we make in the United States have global consequences, right? There are global policies. Does our uh, elected officials decide to stay or in or out of, of global treaties regarding the earth? You know, what are the uh, decisions that we make in those uh, free trade areas uh, and those trade uh, agreements that not only strip workers here of good union jobs, but also go to other countries, steal their national uh, uh, resources, you know, drive, you know, uh, poverty wages over there and pollute their waters on the land, right? So this year, uh, this is why I, I started taking the challenge of vote like a madre, right? Vote like a madre, I think for a Latino, um, I always say when there's a Latino mom, you're gonna find a plant in the corner and no, there's not even a freaking plastic bag that is gonna go to that trash because Latino madres, we are the true mother earth of the world, right? Um, but it's, uh, but it's also more than that. The vote like a madre is also, also a commitment that you do to your children and with your children. So your children understand what is the civic duty and the civic power that they have in their hands. And also you make a commitment that you are not all, only voting for the next four years, you are voting for your legacy. You're voting for the lives, right? That's why this, and it's and it's funny because when I have uh, talk about the vote like a madre campaign and things like that, people, oh, that's the one that J Lo is doing. Well, uh, yes, yeah, but also there's there's 
hundreds of thousands of, of mothers around the United States that, you know, when we vote, we should, you know, remember of our children and the children of our children. We should remember about, you know, La Madre Tierra and what's, what's really at stake in these elections on November 3rd. Wait. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for introducing Botaca Mate. It's really new. And like, could you tell us a little bit more about it? Like, I know like JLo um, is promoting it, but what exactly does it do? How can someone get involved with Botaca Mate? It's, I mean, JLo. Everybody talks about JLo. <laughs> JLo, Zoe Zaldana, um, uh, Salma Hayek, right? Uh, basically, it's about you as a mother, you make this commitment that you're only going to vote for candidates that have a, blow, a bold uh, pl plan for climate change, right? This, the candidates that are talking about, you know, that in their platforms. And uh, so you make this, you know, your pinky promise with your kids, I'm only gonna vote for those that have a commitment to uh, protect the, uh, the environment. And also the vote like a madre, you know how mothers are like organized, we know everything, who's doing what at one time. So it reminds you, you do your vote plan. You know, what are you voting by mail? When does my, my ballot is supposed to arrive? Do I call the, if it hasn't arrived by time, who do I call? How do I follow up? Who do I drive to the post? So that's that's what really vote my, like a madre. We're making a commitment uh, to voting for the next generation. I love that, thank you. And so I was wondering, so that brings us into like the next question of, so like, what are some underrepresented issues on the ballot that face the Latinx community in Florida? And I think like, Carson, would you like to chime in on this? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I wanted to mention a couple things. Um, Savannah, you mentioned um, that you vote for the land. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate, like our wildlife and our parks, like they don't get a vote. But the decisions we make on our ballot in the voting booth or by mail really impact those things. Um, and I think that's one of the underrepresented issues um, for Latinx voters is um, having access to parks. Um, growing up, I grew up in uh, rural Alachua County, High Springs, Florida, and parks were just such an important part of my life. Um, and, you know, being in a rural place, having wide open spaces is you know, pretty commonplace. But in urban areas like Miami-Dade, Broward County, Orange County, um, you know, you might not have as many parks, you might not have um, the focus on parks, but these are the places we have our birthday parties. These are the places we have family reunions. These are the places where we unite together. Um, so I think something that uh, we don't often think about being on our ballot is our parks. And actually right now, um, I did mention Orange County, um, counties like Orange County have local ballot amendments on the on their ballots. So you can literally vote for parks. Um, something else that's, um, you know, thinking about rural communities and the people that live there often, um, you know, these counties that aren't so urban get a lot less funding. So we might not have um, you know, all the educational programs, all the up-to-date infrastructure, um, we miss out on a lot of things. And, you know, growing up, um, I'm the great-granddaughter of Mexican immigrants. I grew up, um, you know, with a pretty close to an undocumented family, a huge family um, that harvested crops in La Crosse, La Crosse, whatever you call it, we call it La Crosse. Um, and, you know, I just saw them work dawn to dusk plus a night shift, you know, granddad's work and he's 95 years old, he's out there picking strawberries, you know, that hard work and seeing them continue to struggle. That's what I vote for. That's what I go to the ballot for because um, like our undocumented Floridians, they don't get a voice at, at the um, ballot box yet. Um, there are so many struggles that they face. Um, and one of those struggles is climate change. So whether you're in on the coast in, in Pinellas County or, uh, you know, in rural High Springs, climate is changing and it's impacting us all in our daily lives. So um, climate impacts um, how we work, where we work, when we get to work. Um, and we have seen temperatures rise 
but zero protections for really essential workers. Um, those who have kept our society running, our farm workers, our construction workers, but they have no, virtually no um, protections or, or standards that come with climate change and rising temperatures. So that's who I vote for. Um, and climate champions are on our ballot. So we can like literally choose um, climate champions or climate change deniers. Um, so I do uh, invite just a just a quick plug and caveat for everyone to um, check out FCB's uh, endorsements at our website fcvoters.org because we went we went through the work of identifying climate change champions um, and we have them listed there as well as the ballots I talked about. Um, so you know your question was um, who do you vote for in, in unrepresented issues? So I vote for. Um, my past for my ancestors who couldn't vote, who toiled on the land and had no protections, but I vote for my future. I vote for um, my two nieces, my two little, my two little um, nieces who are brown girls growing up in a sometimes dangerous world. Um, I vote because black lives matter and brown lives matter. And it's, um, it's imperative now more than ever. That was so well put. Thank you, Carson. And one thing that you mentioned was climate change, you know, it's bringing, it's fueling stronger storms. And those, there are real consequences to these natural disasters, which, yeah, we can't control the, the storms themselves, but we can control our actions today and the legislation today that will, fuel, that will fuel the changes that made these storms worse, you know, and they have huge impacts on everyone. And I would really love to hear from Christia, who is joining us tonight about how this has, how storms like that, such as Hurricane Maria, have impacted you and your people and other Puerto Ricans who have been displaced and have come to Florida. Well, my life changed after the hurricane. Uh, when I was in Puerto Rico, I was happy, right? Uh, the, the economic crisis was affected me, but you know, who doesn't love to live by the beach? Yeah. But when Hurricane Maria, uh, that ends, uh, I never, I never planned to be living here in the United States, but I'm here because of the hurricane. And I'm here because in Puerto Rico, unfortunately, we don't have like the essential services. Like mm. we have them, but they don't work uh, like they're supposed to be, you know, like I grew up uh, without power, like two or three per days of the week, that was like normal. But then I knew like, okay, this is not normal. I, you don't need to, you know, to, okay, this is, this is what it is and it's okay. No, you need like to wake up and do something, right? Like at least do whatever you had in your hands because I know that I cannot change everything, but I can help, right? So when I moved here, I was this place and all my family is there, uh, all my, a lot of my friends too. And when I came here, I, I connect with uh, other Puerto Ricans that came after the hurricanes. I live by the motels at, at Kissimmee and we share the stories. Uh, if, if we are here, it's because we, we are, we, we left the island without, for example, without job. Uh, most of them lost their houses, lost everything, right? So when we came here, we, we connect, we organize, we uh, begin a uh, beautiful work. Uh, and most of them are still working right now in Central Florida and mm -hmm. I'm very proud of them. But now our mission is to vote because we need to vote for all the people that are in Puerto Rico that cannot vote because we are U uh, United States citizens, but we not, well, we can, we can vote if we live at the island. So if we're here, we need to vote for them. We are, our voices but we are the voices of, of our island right so that's that's very important and at this moment you know my family is from Ponce Ponce is at the south of the island and now we have the earthquakes every day now they have another new reality and it's awful you know and and it's sad and it's terrible but they need now to to continue like rebuilding the island uh, because of the hurricane and try to live a normal life with the earthquakes and trying to live a normal life without power, without water. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. So that's why I'm voting. 
Wow, thank you for sharing that with us. That was very deep yeah. and moving and I don't think gets mm -hmm. talked about enough, you know, the very raw experience. And so you, yeah. you work with La Mesa Boricua. Could you tell mm -hmm. us a bit more about La Mesa Boricua and the work that you do there? Well, La Mesa is a movement of movement coalition of organizations and leaders of Puerto Ricans around the state. Uh, I work Central Florida, but I have other co-workers that uh, work Tampa and San Pete and the South area of Miami. And we're impacting right now seven counties around the state. Mm -hmm. And we do, we, we work on five steps. Uh, one of them is civic engagement and all the voter education and, and you know, uh, the connection of the Puerto Ricans with the voter system here, which is very different from, the, from Puerto Rico. Uh, the other bold steps is um, economic development. We work leadership development with them too. And we have a cultural project, uh, which is called La Casita Boricua. And that's a cultural, artistic. And we want, uh, the mission is our kids that are uh, growing up here, don't, don't forget our roots and our culture and, and everything that is so beautiful uh, from us, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the mission of La Casita, like uh, have that cultural uh, impact in our kids uh, from now on. And uh, the last one is the communications and the narrative in the media of our community, uh, which that's one of the things that, that I love to do, right? Like uh, I know from years, for a lot of years, other people or other communities try to, you know, to to talk or to speak uh, on behalf of us. And now that is not happening because we're here, we're working and we're organizing our community. Awesome, yeah. I thank you for explaining that. And um, speaking of organizing, I wanna usher in <laughs> FCB's Chief of Digital Organizer, Jesus, for him to tell us a bit more about, you know, what he'll be doing with Chief what inspired him to take on this work and particularly what the Latinx youth in Florida needs to know to make about the impact of their vote. Thank you, Savannah, for the intro. Thank you everybody for speaking. You guys are doing amazing. I appreciate you guys taking the time out to share your, your experiences because um, just like uh, Crisia was saying, uh, she had to experience moving from Puerto Rico, coming over here. I had, I live in Kissimmee, Florida. So a lot of Puerto Ricans, I have Puerto Rican family. I'm from the Dominican Republic, but I have Puerto Rican family and friends that were impacted directly and thousands and thousands of Puerto Ricans have moved from Puerto Rico over here and I've had to firsthand help and uh, help organize and witness and do what I can to to help and so that brings me back to why I even uh, took this position I myself am passionate about helping people and helping the community and I felt like this position was perfect for me because I always I always wondered what would be, uh, a, a, I guess, a, I would say like everybody wants to help, but nobody knows how to. So this position mm -hmm. gave me uh, an actual plan of action of how I can help my community firsthand. And I represent the youth, um, everybody that's um, growing up. Um, I'm 23 years old. And in just this short life of mine, I've experienced a lot. Um, I'm a child of immigrants, so I represent not only myself, but my family, my undoc undocumented family members, uh, my ancestors, like Carson was saying, and just anybody that doesn't have a voice, I'm here to show you that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you look like, I, I'm doing it you know what I'm saying and and you guys can do it too and when it comes to voting I feel like a lot of our youth are uninformed and they are ignorant in the sense of they don't have the knowledge uh, of what it means to vote and they feel like their vote has no power which is false they need to know that like most people think that voting is literally just you're just voting for the president they don't even know that you there's other ballots and other things that you're uh, voting for. So I represent the youth. Um, I wanna spread a positive impact and show uh, the people, uh, the youth and just everybody that if if you put your mind to whatever it is that you want and that, that being change and helping yourself and helping those people around you that you're able to do that. And I represent 
the, the the future of America because at this point our youth don't understand that in 20, 30, 40 years, we are going to be the, the, the leaders of the world. So we need to start from now and make that change. So, yeah. Yeah, start from now. Exactly, I could not agree more. I'm so amped up about this event, like just talking about all these topics that I feel like I, I personally don't even hear about enough. I, I'm not Latino and I love learning about all of these issues because I'm also from the Caribbean, you know, I'm from Trinidad and everyone has something different that they face and we've all come here together, all of us in Florida, we all ended up here, you know, we all came here and we all want to make sure that we pave the way for other people to who come from where we come from. From our for our fellow men and make sure that we're passing the torch you know so thank you everyone for like speaking to that and now i want to turn to michelle and hear about your work and how we can and what's the bigger picture of the collective strategy of how we can win to amplify the voices of our of our people and the the communities that we are putting at the center of the conversation tonight mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. I think I always live in contradictions. That's my life. And it's OK to live in contradictions. And I'll just start by saying that, you know, like our communities like Latinx, right? Like there is a diversity, right? There is Black Latinx, right? There is brown folks, there is white folks, um, right? And then there's indigenous peoples that have been kind of lumped together in this like Latinx label in the United States, right? That ultimately the strategy is, is erasure. So it's like very complicated, right? With our identity. Um, but that's just to say that all of us are impacted, right? But all of us are gonna be and are being impacted in different ways. Right. So we have like black migrants that, you know, have like triple the impact, you know, of, of, of climate change and like pollution and like all these things aside from the immigration system. So to me, voting is a strategy. Right. And I kind of see it as like the short term strategy, obviously, um, because we know like scientists have told us we have actually like 10 years to cut, you know, half or more emissions to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, right? So we also have we also have that contradiction of time that you know we've been fighting this system in different ways, right? But the system has just gotten right ahead to the point that we're almost at that point of like no return, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're in this moment with the current president, of course, that has just like done so much harm and is just right like white supremacy is like on the rise, right? So we have that. So I see it, you know, I see voting as the strategy, right? That So we obviously need to change this administration, right? But then, you know, like the larger vision is also that we need to change the, the systems, the root systems, right? And that also includes, you know, like not having a two party system, I believe, right? So we also have a long term strategy of, okay, we're gonna vote this one out, but you know, the reality is that the Democratic Party or, you know, other parties, not to mention parties, they still believe in solutions that are market-based solutions. But market-based economies is what got us to this moment, right? So we need to shift the economy entirely from what it is right now. And what it is right now is exploit exploitation and destruction of the environment, right? Which has been translated into women, people of color, queer folks, right? It's the same strategies, exploitation. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's like the contradictions, right? And, and I know we're each like trying to understand, you know, this, this moment and this system with, with our lens. And, and so it's just like so much. Uh, but what I would say is that, you know, I love this space and I definitely wanna encourage more listening because the solutions are there, right? Like indigenous folks have been impacted by this system for so long, right? That they already know, you know, what we need to do, right? Not to mention that it is also because of colonialism and all these things that we're in this place, um, right? Like black women have been working on transformative justice, right? Like systems that don't require the police because the police has never worked for people of color, right? Or anyone. 
So this, the, the solutions are already there. Um, but us, you know, like, I feel like everyone needs to listen to everyone else, you know, like across our movement. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we just need like that collective strategy. And as I mentioned, like some people are already like working on this, like the uh, Just Transition Alliance has been doing a lot of work, also the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, so, you know, there's already like a vision right there but I think we just need to listen and understand that, yes, like voting, we need to vote right now. And there are like super important issues on the ballot, but then we need to have a plan after voting, right? Um, so Absolutely. yeah. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us specifically about Central Florida Climate Action and the work that you do there to work on these issues? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm part of the Alliance. And as I mentioned, it's just different uh, people coming together, right? Um, different parts of the movement. So mm -hmm. one of the strategies, for example, is talking about a just transition and understanding that we need to keep fossil fuels on the ground. You'll see that, you know, some people will present the solution of, okay, let's put a price on carbon or, right? Like we need to keep fossil fuels on the ground, right? Like that's what we need to do. Um, so, for example, I know uh, Poder Latinx here in Central Florida is, you know, fighting to uh, close one of the plants, right? But when we talk about a just transition, we also need to include the labor aspect. So making sure that we're not going to close plants, but then people are going to be left without jobs, right? So it's like connecting everything that we are already doing, labor, climate, right? Um, you know, like all the issues, housing is another one, um, but making sure that like we're connecting and supporting each other and actually like creating a new economy and an alternative, you know, economy. So the Alliance is, you know, has been meeting for a year now, just aligning on like values and vision. And, um, you know, as I said, it's going to be just a lot of strategy and seeing how we can connect and align to change again, like the root, you know, the root causes, right? Because it's also about changing the root causes, dismantling white supremacy, patriarchy, like all these things that, mm -hmm. you know, are are part of the, the foundation. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a lot of work, um, but it's also beautiful work. And I'm excited because as you all mentioned, our communities, like we owe this to our communities, right? And, you know, we have more proximity to the ballot and more access than other communities do, right? I know we mentioned undocumented folks. So we owe it to our communities um, and yeah, and, and to the future, right? I know yeah. you mentioned the future and like, this is also about healing the relationship with the earth, as you said, Maria, you know, so. Yeah, exactly. And two things that you just mentioned that I really want to pull out are uh, energy and housing. Mm -hmm. That could not be more timely with the current issues that are being faced throughout Florida that's significantly impacting minority communities and within that, the Latinx community in Florida. And so like, Maria, you can chime in on this. You know more about it than I do, but the, the moratorium on evictions and um, utilities, our governor just let them expire, you know? And so it's, it's a tragedy, yeah. like, 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 it's a tragedy that we are living today because, um, you know, Florida has been, uh, I mean, going, going back, right, to that mm -hmm. uh, economy of extraction, right? We are in an economy that we live off tourism, and tourism is a very fragile uh, industry, right? Anything yep. happened? I was here on September 11, right? And I and I was here during the and I was here again uh, during when the uh, um, market uh, of housing uh, collapsed in 2014. So I saw these developments, like the one that I live, like abandoned, abandoned, floor closure, uh, people living there mm -hmm. but we're not paying. And who was disproportionately affected? Black and brown communities. And exactly. again, we are in a corner and apparently our elected officials have learned nothing from the past, right? Have, have not learned anything from the past because they are, are, again, setting up Floridians for failure, right? When you say, oh, um, the moratorium the moratorium is going to expire. Oh, I'm, because there's a, a, a national, um, program that is going to protect renters. 
well, what about homeowners, right? What about when you actually think, oh my God, I bought my house, you know, this was my dream, but you got laid off from a part job that you were working, you know, uh, all the overtime that you could, that you actually had a, a union contract that you thought was protecting you, but the industry collapsed. You know, how, what did you do in a situation like that? So yeah. this disconnection and these evictions are going to disproportionately affect black and brown communities. And, you know, it's not, it's not um, something that is not, you know, um, connected to what we believe. That's, that's when we are saying, you know, uh, justice, like green issues cannot mm -hmm. be separated from, you know, labor, from dignity, from justice, because the word is interconnected, right? Is the same way that, you know, we are saying, well, the same way that um, we, created in Puerto Rico, for example, they are, there's a plan that is, you know, creating toxic ashes and those toxic ashes are created by carbon and that carbon, Puerto Ricans passed a law, so the carbon cannot stay in the islands for more than 30 days. So why did they did? The uh, legislature in Kissimmee decided, oh, we'll take the car the, the ashes. They're going to take like 650,000. That is like, that doesn't even, it's not even close to the damage that this ashes is going to create in our community. So the mm -hmm. damage is interconnected. Um, I really will like, you know, other panelists. I know Carson has been working a lot these days on the issue of the disconnections. I know uh, uh, Michelle and, and Chrysia both have extensive um, um, experience, not only on the, um, like Chrissy and myself, we, we have even, uh, last year when the, uh, displaced Puerto Ricans were, were working in a hotel, we were celebrating extensions from FEMA to keep these people with a hotel, you know, on the roof. What really, what kind of celebration is that, right? We are in an unfair system that really, you know, uh, strips communities from their, from their wealth and com co uh, turn them into pawns, into a system that fits from them. Yeah, Maria, um, I do want to say something about the utilities. So um, FCV and our partners in the Miami Climate Alliance, New Florida Majority, and uh, Senator Jose Javier Rodriguez and Rep Escamani, today we talked about on our Facebook Live, um, it's available on our Facebook page at FC Voters, we talked about um, the lack of a utility moratorium. Um, and I'll just keep it real high level for everyone. But basically, um, the governor and public service commission have allowed the utilities to decide how they are going to deal with their customers. Um, you know, it's the utilities think with profit. They're, they're a corporation. Um, so there has been virtually no protections for folks getting their power cut off. And more so, um, an important nuance is the, um, the aid programs that they have or they're offering um, are often not enough. And you have to have a state ID and a social security card and and systematic things that keep undocumented people out. So they're suffering and there's no net. Carson, you mentioned the moratorium. Uh, could you briefly explain for anyone watching this what a moratorium is? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> so for, for this context, it's basically saying um, it's a blanket rule that you, that you can't shut off people's power for non-payment. And what we're asking is we all kind of have a, a feeling and a knowledge that COVID is not going anywhere, folks. Um, so we're asking for a moratorium until June 2021. So that'll get us through hurricane season, which ends in November. That'll get us through Christmas. Like everyone wants a Christmas tree. Um, I mean, that's like, that's a pretty like first world problem. Um, but it also keeps people warm during the winter. So we need this stability because just a little stability can get people back on their feet. We're talking about reopening the economy, but uh, 28,000 Disney uh, employees got laid off this week. Um, there's folks getting laid off here in Tallahassee where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not having power, not having a working shower or Wi-Fi or any of the things that are absolutely essential, that just impedes any kind of opening. And I want to mention something about the, the rent and everything. I know because I'm experiencing that right now, uh, private realtors that are, that are renting houses and apartments and everything, um, 
they are, they are like uh, erasing the late fees right now. Like if you cannot pay by the day one or five, now they are going to begin to, you know, with the late fees again. And it's, that is tragical because I, I, like you say, 2008 um, workers are right now out of Disney. So if you cannot pay your rent by the first or the five, now you're going to have a late fees too, because since the governor opened the state, now they are doing like whatever they want, right? Because they are like private uh, corporations. Wow, just wow. Thank you for giving us a glimpse into that and providing your first-hand experience with that issue, Crisia. Uh, there's so much to be done. There's so much work to be done here. And a big way to combat that is writing to your senators, writing to the governor, you know, being engaged as much as possible. And so Crisia and Michelle, I was wondering if you could tell us some ways that anyone viewing this can get engaged with the organizations that you work with. How would someone get engaged with uh, La Mesa Boricua and with uh, Central Florida Climate Action? Well, with La Mesa, you can find us on Instagram or Facebook as La Mesa Boricua de Florida. Uh, Mesa is, is in Spanish, but La Mesa is table, but in, in social media is La Mesa Boricua de Florida. You can find us there. You can uh, write, us, write us a direct message. We are always like on there, uh, seeing everything that people ask us. So looking you know, off for us over there. Awesome, thank you. And Michelle, how would someone that wants to get involved with your organization connect with you? Yeah, thank you for that. So same, right? Facebook and Instagram, just um, look for Central Florida Climate Action, or I think it's under CFCA. I also want to make another plug um, for the international work. Um, so one of the organizations that I'm involved with is NISGUA, uh, doing work in Guatemala. So we are working on contacting elected officials um, because basically there's these agreements where the United States is trying to prevent as asylum seekers from even reaching the United States physically, right? So what the United States did was Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, like other countries forcing them to receive asylum seekers so that they don't reach the United States. Um, so we are working on that. Um, as well to just end that and right, like make sure that asylum seekers, um, you know, here in the detention centers and in the borders, right, that we are able to protect their rights. So for that, the plug would be NISGUA. So it's Network in Solidarity with the People in Guatemala, NISGUA. So I also like made that, that plug. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Yeah, and just, you know, as we move towards wrapping up, if there are any final comments anyone wants to make about what inspires your vote and how we can amplify the voices of the Latinx community in Florida and really show up for them. Um, this is a great time to do that. Uh, I'll check the chat box and the comments to see if we have any questions from anyone watching before we begin to wrap up. I think I think I would like to. Um, I'm glad that Michelle mentioned all uh, her work on NISGUA, because uh, the globe is interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. um, the same way that the ashes that were, you know, polluting uh, the island are in, in Puerto Rico uh, came here to Florida and and pollute uh, the residents of, you know, Kissimmee and Sun Cloud. The same way that we are irresponsible and we promote, you know, uh, single-use plastics that, you know, go right now. You not only are in the ocean with, you know, and kill, you know, marine life, but also are in the shores of countries in development like Haiti, right? You see mountains of plastic, you know, that, that children play around, right? You see uh, the water getting hotter and hotter that is, you know, racing and sinking uh, shores. And these people that live in the condos are looking for dry ground. So they're moving to communities like Little Haiti, gentrifying and pushing this, you know, historic uh, Black communities, you know, the same way that uh, millionaire uh, corporations decide to dry wetlands and, and build, you know, sugar and, you know, 
the the plan the planet is interconnected and when we vote when we uh you know make a decision to vote that candidates that candidates that want to have a bold plan a plan on climate action candidates that have responsible uh commitments to uh, trade agreements, right? Candidates that that vow to uh, uh, protect our uh, black and brown children, our communities that are growing. You know, I think that we have uh, the opportunity to bring all of those others that are our brothers and sisters, you know, in the planet Earth, to the ballot box with us. You know, but there's also a lot of you know civic action and civic engagement beyond the vote that we shouldn't uh, uh, decide that, you know, it doesn't exist, right? We can organize, we can activate, we can protest, we can write, you know, we can pick it, we can write op it, we can show up for each other. And not only we can, we should, we should. You know, justice is not a matter of a checkbox on election day. Justice should be an issue of 365. And remember that an injury to one is an injury to all. Wow, I could not have said it better myself. Uh, exactly, Maria, an injury to one is an injury to all. We need to continue to show up past election day and be as engaged as possible. And you know, one of the many ways that you can do that is being involved with La Mesa Boricua or Central Florida Climate Action or with FCV. You know, we are doing our best to reach out to voters to encourage people to go by mail and vote for candidates who will work to protect the environment. And a big part of protecting the environment is also pr protecting people. We need to talk about that too, because protecting the environment and sustainable living and zero waste life has all become very easy for a, for a certain economic bracket. We need to like make things easier so that anyone across the board can do their part. You know, we can't put all the burden of, of zero waste and sustainability on individuals. You know, we need to make sure that we're putting that pressure where it belongs and so yeah, Jesus, would you like to chime in on that? Yeah, for sure. So Chispa, the Chispa program is new to Florida. We're a climate focused uh, Latinx outreach and we're in other states such as Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Nevada, and Maryland. And it's important now, uh, now than ever to ensure that families have a strong voice in the decisions and the policies that are impacting their environment and their communities. And this is something that we all depend on right now it, it's imperative that the environmental movement it's better represented and it represents the diversity of our nation and it reflects the solutions that are necessary to confront the legacy of the environmental injustices and that's it's like disproportionately impacting the communities of color so it's just it's crazy what's going on and it's nice to see that we have each other to help each other because if we don't have each other then we have no one so many quotable things tonight yes exactly if we don't have each other who do we have if we can't show up for each other who's going to show up for us you know and uh, um, oh man i lost my chair of thought but exactly so thank you for highlighting that jesus and i just wanted to mention as well that everything is connected your voice doesn't end after election day you need to continue to show up past election day and nothing's going to change unless we work for that change you know none of the, 2020 has been a wild year for us all but 2020's problems are not going to expire on new year's eve you know we have to all work together for that change to you know create the future that we want you know just like you guys said you know we're voting like just like carson said we're voting for our past and for our future you know, so we, we don't have any questions in the comment section, but I would like to invite Maria to like end us off with a strong call to action. I think my main call to action is uh, for everyone that is looking at us to make a plan to vote. Make your plan to vote. Uh, if you are, if you're ready, if you haven't asked for your, I mean, 
uh, you still have time to register to vote if you haven't voted. The last day to register to vote is actually is October 5. So if you haven't registered to vote, you know, take October 5, yeah. Take this opportunity and register right now. You can go to a, a link and, you know, and go ahead. I'm not sure that you, are, am I, are you guys losing me? Is that what's going on? <laughs> no, okay. Five, um, so, five. <laughs> so once you have once you have registered to vote, make sure that you either have a plan to vote or request your ballot on the mail so you can vote by mail. And if you are not going to vote, vote by mail for whatever reason, then vote early. Like, you know, there is nothing safer, safer right now that go and vote early. We have the opportunity to, you know, go in person if you want to. You also have the opportunity to vote early by mail, right? Take your ballot, vote by mail. Look at the, there are important amendments in the ballot, right? They're talking about minimum wage in the ballot. They're talking about uh, the protection of split oak in the ballot. So those are, you know, issues that are important that, that you know, impact our community beyond the presidency, which is important enough, right? So I think take your time, uh, create your plan to vote, uh, vote by mail if you can, or vote early. And uh, talk to your communities about the same things that we are talking about right now. Go back and talk, talk to your communities, talk to your children, talk to your neighbors, talk to your family. I think that we have this uh, culture that talking politics is not polite. Actually, I think that talking politics is the most polite thing that you can do because you can tell That's people, right. I mean, I do care about you. I do care about your issues. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about solutions. Let's explore solutions together. Yeah, that's a whole culture shift to have <laughs> talk about politics. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, everyone. I really want to thank my fellow FCV staff members and um, Anticia and Michelle for joining us tonight. Like this, I, this event would not have been anything without you guys. I couldn't, I literally could not do this alone. So I'm so grateful for the participation tonight. I wanna to remind everyone, you know, to vote. FCB has endorsed a wide slate of candidates and many of whom are members of the Latinx community in Florida. So vote, I vote for environmental champions. And so we don't have any questions tonight and we will see everyone on our next virtual event. I hope everyone has a great night. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Savannah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.